Um, there's a lot of Python. Um, I'm, I'm sitting there with the DevOps guys, um, development guys, Q&A, so I'm doing a lot of testing. I'm seeing a lot of front and back end stuff. It's all in the cloud. Um, we don't even have an LDAP server in our office. And, and it's, we have, I don't know, we have maybe 40 people. We don't even have an LDAP server uh, a directory service right there. It's kind of different. I've always, you know, I've had that. So, yeah, we have a printer. Um, <laughs> nice printer. But, um, yeah, everything's in the cloud. So, it's pretty interesting that, you know, you can offer stuff as a service, and AWS is pretty reliable. So, I think, you know, um, being there in the data center is definitely a great, uh, you know, has been a great business, but I mean, you know, with AWS and Azure on the scene, just kind of like, you know, taking all that in. And so, these little SMB <coughs> data centers, you know, have been kind of get snuffed up and going up to the cloud. Um, Do you use uh, Wi Fi Pineapple? I have one. Um, is it here in my bag? I do have one, yes. And Kelly Lynn. I'd never even heard of that until last month. Was like, that pineapple? Yeah. Okay. Um, and Scout was showing me a little bit about it. Okay. How powerful that thing was. Now, in a few months, I, I may come back and do a cell phone live hacking demonstration. Uh, so that is in the, in the plan. Yeah, the uh, pineapple is pretty nifty. Mm -hmm. um, I was just using it uh, a couple of days ago, and today as well, um, doing some other scenarios. So, it's what exactly is that used for the pineapple? Um, a lot of attacks, such as man mill attacks, um, sniffing, um, SSID, um, you know, connect requests, um, and then if you want to respond to it, which you normally don't want to do unless you own the network. Um, but you can kind of show how, so like for example, um, there's a big media, social media company on the west coast and they've taken the train back home, right? And at every um, train stop, train you know, station, they're finding, uh, let's call it, um, call it Facebook. And they're seeing, oh, I'm connected to my Facebook uh, Wi-Fi. Wow. Oh, wait a minute. What the hell are they doing out here, you know, at the train station? It's because you're sending out, I want to connect to Facebook Wi-Fi, and the guy with the pineapple at the train station sees that and says, okay, yeah, let me respond and say, I'm your guy, I'm your network, connect to me, here, please. And then they insert themselves man in the middle, and you're just surfing like um, it was fine, and then they can do a certificate, uh, fake certificates, SSL stripping, what have you, uh, just to get your passwords, right? So the, uh, the the malware out there today is uh, not just um, you know trying to they don't care to be detected now they're actually hiding themselves much better they're polymorphic so signatures don't really don't really work I mean I can show you an attack where I, I compile the APK or the IPA right there so then the signature changes um, and what they'll do is they'll recite on your phone. Um, and then they'll download the malware code so they're not detected up front. And do they have to root your phone to do all that nasty stuff? No, they don't. If your phone's rooted, then you can be um, detected easily that you have a system tampering. So I've got to be like, well, maybe I should reformat my phone. So they'll just sit in the background and just wait until, you know, um, they have enough day to start sniffing passwords or what have you. So we have uh, a question. Yes. Uh, can you uh, use it uh, into a system that's already infected with a man in the middle? Use, uh, like, our uh, protection detection service? Yeah, product? rather than protect from an infection, can you uh, go into an infected system and begin to clean it out? So what, uh, what Zimperium offers is when you first deploy it to the cell phones, you can push it up via MDM. You don't have to have credentials to log in that way. It gives a risk assessment of all the cell phones out there at your corporation. So you can see what phones have some very old um, versions of iOS or Android, and then actually click and expand and see all the CVEs 
um, you can then enforce policy to say, okay, for the people that have Android 4.2, um, we're not going to allow you to have corporate assets. Um, please update your phone. Um, however, the company wants to do that. So, you know, that's the challenge. A lot of people actually don't update their phones for years um, for whatever reason. Question. <coughs> yes. Are you accessing a corporate uh, relational database? What's going on? So, uh, for corporate uh, deployment, we don't yeah. capture any um, PII. We just don't host it on the cloud. So, it's only from your MDM. We sync to an MDM where that information would reside. Uh, our console, our, uh, our front end. So, uh, we connect to the MDM via an API and then uh, also connect down to uh, the product on the phone. So if you update your threat response policy via our console, um, as well as you know updated on what the MDM can do, then it gets uh, pushed back to our uh, back end and back down to the phone, and it'll update. So like you know they can, you guys admins can change it on the fly um, if needed. You can have different groups. You know, VIPs or guys that travel to, to different parts of the world. Um, we, we've got people that say, you know, if our competitor were just to know where we are in a certain part of Asia, it would just, um, open, you know, open the cards actually to what we're doing in our business next. And we they can't afford to do that. So um, a lot of uh, financial uh, companies have to protect their assets because these guys are going after the money. Much more so. It's worth it. You know, high valuable target like that. You look good? I think you're good. Enough. All right. Thank you. I'm a nation. Um, and even 
you know, depending on this system here, it could be 64-bit ARM. Who's heard of the Raspberry Pi? Anybody? Okay, good. Um, I came across a, a software guy that never heard of the Raspberry Pi, so um, that's good that you guys know about that. Um, so yeah, any of the, uh, you know, the world's analog, right? So you have to convert that to digital, as you know, and you can process it, send over the network, have the CPU work on it. And as you know, these are a lot of the different mediums of transport. So Zigbee is an interesting one because it's RF mesh. It's based on 802.50.4. Bluetooth just released their mesh standard um, a couple weeks ago. So it's a broadcast, they actually flooded broadcasting standard right now, so it's not that efficient, but it's much more backward compatible. So Bluetooth is trying to be everything else. They're trying to be higher speed, longer distance as well with Bluetooth 5 that's been just released uh, technically in December. Um, and so now they're trying to compete with Zigbee and Ethernet. And so um, Zigbee is good for like a lot of uh, automatic meter reading and industrial applications out there. Um, it's actually growing, but what's on your cell phone? You have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So those guys are going to kind of leverage a lot off of what's already on your, on your cell phone. Um, of course, everything goes to the cloud. Um, so, you know, our technology um, keeps advancing and allows the society to also uh, accelerate, advance, what have you, in good and bad ways. I mean, uh, look at social media, right? I mean, Look how many people are complaining on Twitter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're actually teenagers, right? I'll leave it at that. Um, as I mentioned, embedded processors are everywhere, right? 8 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, even. Um, you know, the Cortex is popular. The ARM is definitely pushing out to these end nodes. They're currently 32 bit today. Um, Wireless connections are everywhere. Back in the 90s, Wi-Fi was a standard, and it was like one or two megabits per second. And it was like, this is cool, wow. And it just didn't take on, I mean, early 90s. Um, and then it finally caught on, right? I mean, and then it just kind of took off. Um, so now you have Bluetooth 5. Um, you have proprietary RF links. I don't know, how many has heard of um, Sigfox, Laura, or Ingenu? Nobody? OK. So Sigfox is proprietary, it's like a, a carrier uh, business model where um, you have the end nodes, they're going to provide the base station, and they're going to charge like say a, a dollar a month to have your end nodes uh, send uh, sensor data back upstream, duplex, but mainly upstream. Um, Aura is long range, well Sigfox can actually go um, a good few, several miles. Um, Laura actually is short for long range is another standard. Cisco actually is licensed for technology. So you look up Cisco or you should find it. It's, it, it can actually do um, several miles in the, in the uh, country um, with just a regular type of antenna. Nothing more than that, just a rubber duck antenna. Um, what is cool about Laura is you can take that in the city with a ton of buildings and deep into your basement with a ton of RF and it will still send a very low bit rate, but messages. All we want in, in, in using these technologies wirelessly is just messages, sensor data, right? We don't need anything high speed. So Internet of Things is going to encompass all of the above, um, and I'm just breaking it down to some of these technologies or standards. Um, 5G, there's going to have the, the higher bit rate for your phone, but what's cool is the NB, IoT, and the LTM. So there's a couple standards out with 5G that is going to do the cellular modem um, embedded into a smart device that's connected to the cell network. Um, and you know, they've been doing that al al already, but they've been doing it with like 3G and 4G and those just take a lot of battery power. So 5G is designed to really let that battery last uh, much longer um, and actually go to sleep for real, like on its own, you know what I mean? And then, um, and actually have the chipset, the module go from, what is it, $15 a day to even down to $5. So, um, EPS, NFC, you know, your cell phone has, um, has everything on there. Um, the sensors are going into all kinds of nodes. 
Um, and so the new, cell phone, the new iPhone's going to be interesting. What kind of sensors are coming out on it? What you can do with it? Um, so Sigfox, again, just a visual for some people. It's just a proprietary link. This is some gigahertz, so this is 900 megahertz, or it could be 434 megahertz. Um, secure, and then it goes to the cloud. It typically uses uh, MQTT. Who started of MQTT? Kafka, anybody? Any software guys? Right here. Um, CoAP is another one that is connectionless um, that uh, is also being used in others. All right. This is the Semtech, uh, the long range. It's basically the same thing, it's just another competing standard. Um, but they don't have the telecom model. You can actually build the base station, right? The transmitter. On Sigfox, you can't build the transmitter. They're going to license, they're going to sell it as a service by the month, right? So people are trying to do stuff as a service, many ways to monetize um, IoT. So look at this. This is um, um, random, random phase multiple access by Ingenu. And this is based on the 802.15.4, which Zigbee is based on. And this is the DFW area. They really have, we have 17 base stations already deployed that, that you can connect your sensor nodes today. And this is an RF mesh, actually actual topology, um, that just came out, I think, um, last year, actually. So this is what uh, they found out uh, in Jenna has discovered in, in their research. Six out of ten devices provide user interfaces who are vulnerable to a range of issues such as cross um, scripting and weak credentials. Ninety percent of uh, devices had one piece of uh, collected at least one piece of personal information. Um, Seventy percent with raw authentication methods were doing um, account enumeration. So instead of saying your credentials did not compute or your information does not match, um, they were saying your password was incorrect or your ID could not be found. Well, that just gives the, the hackers um, more information to do the bits of it. And I don't recall the, the, the website, but there was at least one in this past week that actually said uh, your password was incorrect or your ID could not be found. And it was something like, not LinkedIn, but it was a big name on there. And I'm like, they shouldn't even be responding that way. But there's a lot of um, authentication systems that are not doing the best practices. 70% um, are doing uh, transmitting over un unencrypted uh, networks. So technically, you could be sniffing this stuff with an RF uh, receiver, right? And a lot of people are doing that. That's why they're hacking cars still today, um, just with a software-defined radio and listening to the transmission and then injecting a similar form uh, frame or, or, or message. Um, so IoT is reaching critical mass, right? But when? I've seen all kinds of predictions. You can see them. Everybody's saying by 2020, there's going to be 20, from anywhere from 28 to 75 billion connected devices to 7 billion people on this earth. So that's around seven devices per person. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have that already today. But um, I think one of you folks back there uh, doesn't want to get into the IoT, um, <coughs> but it may not even have uh, you know more than just a cell phone. Um, so well, they, they have to use IPv6, right? There's no more IPv4. That's port. definitely the only way to go, right? Correct. Um, and thank God they've been working on IPv6 and implementing that, deploying that for several years now, right? At least 10 years or so. Um, the data and revenue streams will be huge, so that means your data centers don't have to be bigger. Uh, companies are trying to find new revenue streams, so, um, but life can only get easier or simpler, right? Yes, question? You mentioned software-defined radios. Did you talk about that earlier while we were getting technical issues? No, I didn't, I didn't mention that, that earlier. If you might explain what software-defined radios sure. are. So it's um, down to the chip level, layer one, uh, transmit, receive. It's just kind of like software-defined networks in many ways. Um, so instead of like it transmitting and receiving at a fixed frequency, or maybe a little bit of a range, because you can program it a bit, but the uh, capacitors, resistors, and the inductors and that kind of restrict it to the range, the small range. Um, it basically works on um, 
playing DSP in advanced way to where you have the, uh, the analog front end, um, it can adapt to a whole range of frequencies. So basically it means instead of being able to operate in a real small range of transmitted and frequencies, it can do the whole gamut and actually uh, much more uh, modulation schemes as well. You can, you can go down and pick up a software-defined radio at the local ham store that will cover uh, one kilohertz two gigahertz, buy that for a couple hundred bucks, and tap into just about anything. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of similar to like the scanners. Uh, who did radio scanners back, air taps back in the day? Anybody? Cam? Like okay, 90s. So, um, so yes, um, you can actually take a, a Raspberry Pi, an S software-defined radio, um, put it together, <coughs> and start uh, trying to characterize um, stingrays. Who knows what a stingray is? Good. So a stingray is one of those uh, mobile base stations that um, certain groups like to use to kind of uh, hone in on certain people to see where they're at, um, downgrade their encryption, maybe spoof uh, some messages and things. So, it, um, so there was, there was a there was a meme that I didn't get to put on here, but it basically said, "What would you believe if if I could get the whole world to uh, uh, over 25 years to uh, have them hold a tracking device and have them pay for it? Would you believe them? <laughs> Let's look at it now. Supercomputer, right? We all pretty much carry a supercomputer for the most part, and it tracks you." Um, and you can't really live without it, right? I mean, you try, but too long. <laughs> um, so life can only get easier and simpler, right? <clears throat> With all this technology. Um, it just gets more complicated, right? So we go, let's go back a little bit to uh, the 40s. Von Neumann architecture, this is just microcontroller. It looks like this, an input and output, a math uh, computational unit, every unit, what have you. So how many have seen this in class? Wow, there's some people, good. So he, John von Neumann, coined the term singularity in the 50s. So back then, I bet you people thought uh, this guy was just off his rocker, right? Look at what it means. Um, you know, artificial superintelligence will abruptly trigger runaway technology growth, resulting in unfathomable changes to human civilization. And now. You this is a pre preface to where you see some of the governments getting a little leery about IoT and society. Um, so there would be a runaway reaction of self-improvement cycle with each new and more intelligent generation occurring more and more rapidly, causing an intelligence explosion and resulting in a powerful superintelligence that would qualitatively far surpass all human intelligence. That just sounds amazing. Back to this guy that Exactly. Yes, sir. The uh, the Twitter for the Cisco End User Group actually shared a link to a uh, Facebook AI that actually created its own language with the other AI. They started talking to each other and they shut it down because they didn't want it to get go any farther. Exactly. That's that's one of my slides in here. Good point. They didn't know what they were saying to each other. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know what they were saying to each other, and I don't know if they shut it down because they were scared. It kind of seemed like that. I think they sh it seemed like they shut it down because it was useless. Didn't give them any benefit, but. I mean, I wouldn't shut it down. I'd see like how far you go. Have more <laughs> <laughs> You know, you can then have your hand on the on the power. So then let's move up a couple of de more decades to Metcalf. Well, I think a lot of you guys may have heard of it. First apply to telecom, you know, the more nodes, the more exponential your benefit's gonna be. You can see it visually there. So do more nodes actually mean more value? Yes, but maybe more complexity. When technology fails, man, does it hurt, right? Like today, it just something was uh, flipped the wrong way, and we couldn't do anything. We, we were just stuck. Um, so I won't read you the definition of that. Uh, Ray Kurzweil. We're going to go uh, forward a couple more decades. So uh, he actually works for Google today. Um, singularity is near. He wrote a book I think around 2005-ish, and he was saying basically the same thing as uh, von Neumann that. Um, Evolutionary progress is exponential because of positive feedback. Um, 
And so you have all these different groups of sciences and technologies that are accelerating and kind of plateau, and it kind of helps the other one kind of take off, and then it's just all compounding upon itself and exponentially just going up, right? So, uh, you know, some of the advances here he mentioned is computing with light. We don't quite see that yet. Quantum computing. We are starting to see that on the, uh, if some people will debate if it's true quantum or not. Um, but you can actually, uh, IBM last year offered quantum computing as a service. Now I kind of chuckled and thought, you know, how much would it cost? It didn't say. And would anybody qualify if they had the money? Right? I doubt it. But they did offer quantum computing as a service. I thought that was pretty good publicity. Uh, although, you know, um, there's a lot you can do with quantum computing. We'll get a little bit more into that. But um, how, how many people know about quantum computing can or cannot do, or just how amazing it could could be to technology? That's you might, right? There, you could potentially um, crack um, encryption extremely fast. So that could put all of your encryption encrypted packets um, moot if they can crack it extremely fast with quantum computing. Um, all right, so let's look at uh, just the IoT setup here. These heart rate monitors could be anything out there. Again, it's just a topical diagram. You got Wi-Fi, you got Bluetooth, you got Zigbee. You have gateways and access points. Um, you know, you're gonna have a different framing layer, layer one as well, layer two, and then the IP layer will, will just carry it from, say, the end node. If you're end node, it has an IP address. Um, but typically, the microcontroller will, and then it's gonna have sensors right off. Um, battery operated, radio as well, on a single chip. Just amazing. And then it's truly low cost, right? So, what does that sound? Low cost? Is it going to do, uh, have a lot of storage? Um, are people going to make it really secure? Seeing some of the research so far, um, but they want it to sell and they just want to get it to market. And we can update the firmware, right? Yeah, okay, that'd be perfect. Ship it. So, um, you know, typical uh, database for configuring, et cetera, um, you know, depending on the topology, right, Zigbee. So Zigbee runs on top of 15.4, and it has cluster libraries that are just humongous. Well, the next generation of uh, IPv6 RF mesh is called Thread that Google has on, under their Nest uh, platform. So that actually throws away all those cluster libraries and says, okay, you're just like a laptop or cell phone, you write the application, we don't predefine it. So Zigbee has all, a lot of that predefined. You've got to wrap your head around it. Bluetooth has a lot of profiles predefined that you hope your car still stays connected to your Bluetooth when you update the firmware on your smartphone, right? Right. How many of you have experienced your, your, uh, your Bluetooth on the car just doesn't always, who even uses their Bluetooth in their car? Oh, there's a lot of people that have a, Bluetooth in their car and always doing this. Well, next month, the state of Texas, I understand you can't even hold your phone while driving, right? So, um, look into getting your Bluetooth working on your car if you haven't already this, this summer. Um, so, the promised benefits, which are good. So, you know, a lot more efficient. You can save on natural resources, save energy. A lot of what's driving IoT today is really not the residential side. The majority of the spend is on the commercial because they can see realized benefit instantly. They're going to save on energy. They're going to save on natural resources. They're going to save money. Um, and so a lot of these guys like Verizon um, and AT&T, while they want to drive more traffic onto their base stations, and like the Amazons and Azures, they want to drive more traffic to their cloud, um, I know that companies like Verizon uh, they want to get into the IoT market if they can find a whole new revenue stream that has nothing to do with the base station. Um, so, more optimization for just in time. So, let's talk about some of the recent buzzwords. 1950s, the, the artificial intelligence was coined, and that was just to prove that a computer could play the simple checkers game. Machine learning actually came out in the 80s, and um, neural networks, I think, was the name back then. I heard of it a bunch in the it kind of came out, some good research and things, and it kind of plateaued. Well, machine learning is kind of based off of that, and it's here now. Um, and you're seeing it everywhere. So
So um, again, you know, large inputs of data to train the engine, um, you know, where robust algorithms um, give it the ability to learn. And that is something that uh, is interesting, like you said, the example there, right? Uh, Facebook had two bots um, talk to each other in their own language if they decided to, however they wanted to, and they did. They decided to come up with their own language, and we could, you know, human beings could not understand it. <coughs> so they shut it down for whatever reason, but not to say they can't turn it back on or someone walks in with, you know, a man in black and just takes it over or something. That reminds me about uh, this movie on Colossus, um, it was based on a book where um, the United States developed a network system of this guy named called Colossus and a Russian about well, the Soviets developed a counter called Guardian that who communicated and developed their own language. And uh, both the Soviet Union and the U.S. Um, uh, severed a link. However, what happened is that they had a code assault plan between the two. They launched a nuclear strike on each other with the ultimatum to reestablish the link. That was an old movie back in the 70s. Right. This is the Boys of Colossus and Guardian. We are right. one. Right. If you remember that. Before my oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go watch it. It's interesting. Yes. So deep learning is next, right? So what deep learning is, is, the, uh, is taking machine learning a step further. Um, and what's interesting on those benefits, I'm not, I don't know the science, and it's all there. It's, Definitely bringing book to reality. But so here's an example image recognition, even better than humans, recognizing indicators in MRI scans for tumors and tissue or cancer in the blood. So instead of having a doctor that has been practicing that, now they're going to rely on deep learning to do that for them. They do a better job than humans. Wow. Google DeepMind, um, they have this Go game. I don't know really much about the game. I understand it's an old game, much more complex than chess. Um, and so what they had, what they did was um, they used deep learning um, and had one of the opponents, and they cloned it, have it uh, play it itself. So you got a machine, deep learned and trained, uh, playing the game with another guy. Uh, computer, another computer, sorry, another computer, um, to train it even better. So that's an interesting concept. It's not just machine against human, it's machine against machine, and machine gets better, even better, right? So what do they do? They, they play that against the, um, the grandmaster of the world, and the computer won. This was just last year. Again, I don't know much about the name, uh, the game Go. It's supposed to be so much more complicated and very old compared with chess, but the fact that they took uh, one deep mind opponent and had it play against another machine, and then it got even smarter and beat the grandmaster, I mean, that's that's not just a simple checkers game, right? Um, and then Google TPUs, the tensor processing unit, it's actually a chip that Google has designed. And they have a whole farm already available today as a service for the research people. Uh, to do ML processing on the Google Cloud Platform. So again, I don't know how many of you guys know about Google doing chips and boxes. So they have been designing chips and, and routers and things for a good several years. This is one example. They're just pushing the envelope doing, you know, um, machine learning, deep learning processing on their own custom chip. Do they have kits available for it to attach to your workstations? Sorry? Network? Do they have a sense of processing uh, card that you could attach to your workstation? Uh, no, I, I don't think so yet. I, mean, I don't think so. Um, augmented reality is on the horizon. Who's heard of Magic Leap? The most valuable startup of all time. So they're somewhere in South Florida. They're kind of quiet, small town. They've received more than $4.5 billion from investors to date, and they're still not shipping a product. But what they're doing is, is they've got light field overlay lenses, suppose they spent a billion bucks perfecting the prototype so far, and so they can project um, virtual reality, augmented reality onto these lenses, and it's transparent, so I can see everything, and then they can pop it, whatever they want to pop in, uh, something floating in, and those objects that I see can interact with reality on, on what I'm seeing. 
and they have this stuff working. There's a couple videos only on, on Google. I was tempted to put one, but there's a couple videos that highlight some of these for several seconds. Very impressive stuff. Um, look up magically. I mean, I'm like, wow. That's a ton of money from Google. Everyone else has invested in, in, in magically. Um, another concept here is machine assisted, uh, human, sorry, human assisted machine intelligence versus machine assisted human intelligence. So are we enhancing the machine uh, because we're smarter, generally, from history? Machines are not better than us, right? So are we enhancing the machine by giving it better uh, machine learning algorithms and training it better so it we make it better? But then it's turning around and helping us, you know, spot the cancer in the, in the MRI scan. So you got two things going on, right? Um, I don't want to talk about how people are embedding sensor chips into the body and having more permanent fixtures, and they actually have, you know, people that have um, need another eye. They have they have a they have an electronic module that replicates an eyeball in the air today. So, um, you know, are we kind of like hybridly uh, helping each other? Um, and then com quantum computing, as I mentioned. Um, is based on quantum entanglement. So Einstein called this spooky action at a distance because he wasn't really uh, comfortable with the concept back then. And, and in short, what it means is you could have um, two bits um, uh, entangled together informationally at an extremely long distance. And just China, um, this last uh, this last month that they can do transmission at 1,200 uh, meters, so, no, I'm sorry, 1,200 kilometers. Um, the best I think science has done to date has been, um, you know, several miles, and that's amazing because, like I said, you change one bit, uh, qubit on this side, and the entangled qubit on the other side, seven, several miles away, changes in real time. And we don't understand that force field. And Einstein back then, he didn't, he didn't even uh, talk, he didn't even uh, stand up to it. He called it spooky action at a distance. So again, that's quantum computing, and there's so much more going on right now. If you look at the guys from NASA and Google, and a company from Canada, um, it's it's around the corner. And then Watson, co co cognitive computing, is a simulation of human thought processes in a uh, computerized model. Um, you've seen the commercials of Watson. You, you see a lot of companies, um, you know, utilizing Watson. Um, it involves self-learning systems that use data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing to mimic the way the human brain works. So, yeah, it sounds pretty good. It's not a human being yet, but you know, look where we've come, and look look where we're going. No, nobody really knows. It, it, be amazing. Um, top ML trends. So this is from um, MapR blog. So this is what they think are the top machine learning trends. Hyper personalization. So um, extremely personalized um, tailoring marketing to you due to the ML. Okay. Context driven marketing, but like extremely because they supplied ML. A real-time sentiment analysis and response. So when they say you blog that you hate this on Amazon reviews, in real time, ML is going to like put that picture together and say, hey, maybe we should, you know, send you um, a replacement or give you a, a nice gift at your doorstep the very next day because you said something really nice. Uh, social customer care, behavioral analytics, predictive and prescriptive. So that's. You know, predicting what you're going to do next and maybe prescribing what we think you need next, right? Apple wants to surprise you and then have you say, oh my gosh, I can't live without it. So that's prescriptive, but predictive, what you think you what think you need. Using ML, this is all ML applied. Uh, natural language generation, so conversational chatbots. I've been seeing some chatbots. I haven't tried to talk to them, but they're out there, right? Some of these chatbots are trying to hack you. Um, so that can only progress. Agile analytics, um, so that's just uh, applying ML to regular analytics in the field. Agile, uh, 
deployment. Um, influencer marketing. So taking uh, just a certain part of your feedback or message and just rebroadcasting that to some other parts of social media as needed. Wow, I mean, that's kind of like be careful what you say because something could be taken out of context and rebroadcasted by, by a machine, um, you know, but they want to try and, you know, leverage that. Um, journey scientists, your whole history of, of um, is your story. So understanding your, your history of, you know, the problem you had, what you tried to fix, maybe you went into business and built that widget, and now you're making money hand over fist. Well, that's just kind of an amazing story. But, I mean, your specific story, um, they want to understand it um, and, and you reuse that. So, again, that's kind of on the lines of, uh, you know, privacy. Um, and in this country compared to Europe, they're not as strict yet. But um, journey sciences, this is a little more, uh, sorry, um, context-based customer engagement through IoT. So knowing the knowable via ubiquitous sensors. So by having all these IoT sensors around you and tracking you, essentially, because they have that history and they have so much more data, like, you know how much data you're, you're just leaving out there, the fact that you go, you know, down the street two times a day, once in the morning and once at back, and then everybody's doing other thing. And then you, you, you go and you, on Tuesdays, you buy this, and you go to this store, you do that, and then you bump into your friend on Thursday night, and you take an extra hour to come, you know, to come home. Nobody sees that. Well, these sensors can see it. That data can be, um, can be uh, captured. And you know what? ML can process that. They can characterize it and say, ah, I see a pattern here. This guy may be seeing somebody like on Thursday nights, or, well, this guy's got a crazy day. He's about to have an accident. He keeps doing that at that speed on you know, that intersection on a Monday, and this, you know. So all what we're doing, we're not leaving a digital trail today, but we're leaving it. It's just not being captured. But when it does get captured with all the IoT sensors, um, these ML machines, or engines, they can really uh, characterize you more than you care, right? Um, and maybe some of you don't care, but um, you got to assume that the government is trustable, right? I have nothing to hide, but I'm assuming I can trust the government to do the right thing by seeing all my information with my tracking device and say, yeah, Mark's a good guy. He has nothing to hide. So they met the assumption that they're trustable, but the government's human. They're going to, they're, they're going to do mistakes, intentionally or not. Um, hype cycle for IoT standards and protocols. So as you know, there's a lot of standards and protocols. Um, and this is from Gartner. This just came out this year, uh, last month. So I don't know all of these. Uh, I don't follow every one of these standards. There's, but as you see here, you've got Bluetooth that's kind of going on an up, uh, upslope. Um, Antiki is an operating system for 32 bit microcontrollers. You've got LoRa, you've got uh, narrowband IoT, the base station standard under 5G, uh, Sigfox, 202.11ah. How many people know about that? So it was a standard uh, from IEEE to give you uh, lower powered Wi Fi at longer distances. Great idea. Just never, never, can't even buy. Can't even buy a product today. I mean, we need to clear someone made the chip. You know, that is. Great idea. I want lower bit rate, longer distance Wi Fi. Why not? No, well, look what Bluetooth's doing. Faster bit rate, longer distances. They're doing like 2x the bit rate and like 2x the, uh, the distance with uh, Bluetooth 5. Um, what else? IPv6, yeah. Six low pan, six e, what have you. Um, any questions? Any of this uh, new for some of you people? Everything. All right. Um, benefits again. So make it all wireless, add more sensors. Uh, why don't you add more compute storage as well, right? I mean, things get, operating systems get bigger and compute power kind of exponentially grows and for about the same price, you know, price is constant and exponentially the compute power goes up. Same storage. Look at, look at your uh, flash drives versus. Uh, Ten years ago, I mean, you're exponentially you can buy so much on a flash disk or hard drive compared to you know 10, 15 years ago. Um, so 
people will feel more in control with having more wireless sensors, right? I get to see that information. I get to turn off that light bulb. I get to see that temperature in my attic. It's all remote. It's all wireless. It's all on my smartphone. Um, it's all on a web browser page, some, you know, um, panel. Um, people feel more in control. Um, you know, governments too. So they uh, they like you carrying this around with you all the time. Um, so with artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning, IoT will be much more contextual, predictive, and prescriptive. As I kind of went through. Now there's a person called. Kranz, he's a Cisco VP of Corporate Strategy uh, Innovation Group. Maybe he's someone we uh, might want to have uh, come down and talk sometime. Um, he, he, he has written that artificial intelligence is the brain and IoT is the body. So it kind of, kind of makes sense. It's not just IoT embedding sensors, it's you're adding everything under the um, AI umbrella to that. And that's what I'm seeing, you know, starting now and going forward versus, say, a couple of years ago. Trade-offs. I think you guys know some of the trade-offs. Expensive. The hardware costs a bunch of money. Uh, continual uh, software firmware updates uh, requires frequently recurring end-user setting changes. Like how many times when you do an update, something stops working and then they change the GUI because they say it's so much better. As soon as you're productive, they change the GUI and they've added more settings and they rearrange and you don't know where that setting is and it's, and it's broken. And you're like, my gosh. So that's why some people don't care to fix it if it's not broken, right? I wish the marketing guys that do the GUIs for Office and, and OSs would just not touch. That's just me. Um, do improvements, but don't rearrange it totally, right? So you're lost. I mean, how many guys, I think, and ladies, if it can have the same sentiment? Anybody? Come on, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm older than I look, trust me. <laughs> um, so here are the trade-offs. I call it SPS, security, privacy, and now safety. Because with all of the grid going to sensors and meshes and integrated, I'm sorry, uh, you know, connected to the internet um, and automatic, uh, it could go down. Um, you don't want to have electromagnetic pulse hit anywhere where there's, you know, financial center like New York or big city like LA, you don't want it. You know, electromagnetic pulse blow up hard drives and, and traffic systems and I mean ATMs, you couldn't get cash if it blew it all up, right? EMP, a big EMP pulse. I mean look how um, you know look how close we are to some EMP incidents coming from North Korea, right? I mean who would have known just a few years ago that it's escalating a bit more than you want. Knows where it's going to go. Um, so, so potentially large attack space, bad actors to infiltrate with, uh, with the IoT. So you have all these other vectors than just the regular ones you guys are used to, and so they definitely enter off of that. Wireless is such a great way to get in because you know Wi-Fi. You can't see the guy. And he gets in on one device and then he sniffs or what have you. And pivots to other corporate assets. Um, your reputation could be uh, ruined. Um, intellectual property could be stolen, lost revenue. Privacy issues, your PII can be stolen. Um, there are software systems that have leaky uh, information, not necessarily by design, uh, not intentional, they just are, have a either not a good uh, software uh, development life cycle, um, or the libraries they're using um, are just kind of crappy, right? I mean. There are cases, who, who thinks like the iPhone is very secure and you don't get problems with it? I mean, they have that image, right? Well, there's a, uh, Xcode was with the um, development platform that Apple had. And in Asia, they were just um, rebundling some libraries and, and reposting those so that they didn't have to go back to Apple because it was kind of hard to do that, to download the, the original tool set, tool chain. So it took, uh, so all these apps were being built in Asia with uh, Xcode and these other libraries that appeared to be fine. And their apps were getting published, like WeChat and all these other ones. Well then, it was finally discovered that these libraries had a ton of vulnerabilities. And so what did Apple do? Wait, wait, Apple Play Store, sorry, Apple App Store is vetted, right? 
It's solid. It's not you no know, malware, right? Apple yanked all those applications after what two years? I mean, who would have known? Um, and then, so like I said, the safety. So the grid can be taken down. Um, this is where the government is getting uh, a little antsy. Um, they don't want chaos because uh, then they lose control. Um, and it's not just maybe losing control, but they don't want to have really bad things happen where people, you know, uh, with chaos happening, with just things going crazy and out of control. Um, so the things that we rely, rely upon, you know, with auto, autonomous transportation, um, I mean, like, wow, who's going to pay for that insurance of the computer crashing, like killing somebody? Or worse, maybe putting you in a wheelchair. You wish you were dead, right? Um, I think it's a 180 degree flip from the cruise control. Why do you think you have to turn on your cruise control today and then hit set? It's a liability thing that the big th or the automakers make you say, no, you can't sue us. You hit on first, then you hit set speed. Well, they want to flip to where the computer drives you. And look how many people have died. So there's been a couple of people that have died so far in their, um, their you know, uh, their Tesla, right? I mean, sad, but. It's already happened um, in, the, in the bad GPS maps, right? So again, who's going to, the insurance in the course is probably going to have to figure that out now. Um, so that's just part of the, uh, the safety side. It's not just security, and a lot of times security and privacy is under that term, right? It's the safety of the of society. I'm just showing you another diagram here. Um, you could have a, another subcloud in that as um, like the medical industry. Um, so. You know, this is where it gets all exciting. You have all these different protocols, um, all these different opportunities. <coughs> if you like, if you like this technology, if you like uh, wireless control and programming, and what have you, with Python, with everything else in between. Um, like I said, all this data um, has to go somewhere. You could have the response. You know, today I don't expect privacy anymore, but you never know what what is going to happen down the road. Leveraged in a, in a bad way that no one thought of today. Um, they can get released to the open internet and it go to places that you're not even aware of. They're not aware of until some hacker finds out. And uh, what was that one hack with the HVAC? They 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 pegged it to heat or cold um, and, and embarrassed the company, so they lost reputation and revenue and what have you. Um, so why why do we have all these challenges? So all these challenges are great for y'all's career if you want to, you know, of course, um, there's a ton of ch challenges here because all the proprietary protocols, there's no standard for interoperability. There's no standards for securing this, right? I mean, we have some methodologies that keep getting preached up, and you'll see here in some of the next slides uh, where the government's starting to get involved. Um, so here again, you see um, just another diagram. I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, do this for my day job, guys. I don't. That's why I'm kind of giving credit for people off, off the internet, right? Um, so you have all these things, operating systems from, you know, embedded, uh, embedded Windows IoT. There's embedded, uh, there's a Windows 10 IoT long-term service branch that you can get on the edge routers today. It's basically, uh, like Dell and HP, reinventing the, a product to make more money. Because a desktop PC or server doesn't really make much more money for them, much money for them anymore. So they're making it an IoT gateway. They're removing the fan, making it ruggedized, a uh, heavy heat sink. Um, so they're offering Ubuntu. They're offering Windows 10 long-term service branch. I think because Microsoft's kind of um, funding that. Intel's behind a lot of that because Intel wants to keep selling chipsets. They're not selling a whole lot to desktops, right? Right. I mean. So you've got you've got modules um, that make it easier for someone to put down. They put down a chip. They put down a module. It's got a lot more software there. It's uh, a lot less stitching software development they have to do. With these wireless connections, 80% of the work is in software. Um, and then you know the network. Um, it typically goes through a gateway. Tons of different protocols. A lot of opportunity to process those protocols. Python is definitely. What have you, Kafka, and whatnot, um, and then of course the cloud stuff, all the analytics and security and 
the typical cloud uh, suspects, right, for service. Um, Jeff, let's get to Cisco, right? I mean, this couldn't be a real Cisco presentation without Cisco. Um, so I looked up uh, what Cisco had from the upside. I don't work for it, or I don't have any, you know, NDA contacts or information. Um, so this is all from the upside. Um, they don't have a whole lot, to be honest. They bought Jasper, an IoT company, uh, last year. And so, basically, uh, what Jasper is is a, an embedded cellular modem um, offering. So they embedded, embedded cellular modems into, you know, trucks and what have you. Um, and so that's mainly Jasper's product offering today. If you want to get into Cisco IoT, it's going to be Jasper. It's going to be cellular embedded modems. It's hot. Um, cellular modems are hot coming out of AT, AT&T and Verizon today. And I hear even T-Mobile and, and Sprint are coming out with IoT services. Um, so you've got your typical uh, you know, uh, blocks here as part of the whole system. Um, again, it's cellular modems. Um, but take a look at all these other companies. Cybersecurity, fitness, energy, smart home, industrial, retail, healthcare, agricultural, software and networks. All these guys are new company names that you probably haven't seen most of those. Um, there are tons of companies out there. If you guys are really deep in the software and whatnot. You've seen some of these names maybe. But there's all kinds of guys just rushing out for trying to make uh, some money in, in IoT space. So they're making money in IoT, and then there's a lot of guys just coming up with a secure uh, product or service uh, to make it easier for some of you guys. Here I'm just throwing up a, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon, AWS, IoT. They have a whole stack written up. They actually have SDKs, development kits. Azure has this too. Azure has hardware development kits, kind of like the Raspberry Pi. Actually, Azure, we're connected to the Raspberry Pi, that you can buy actual hardware for some of you maker guys or what have you, or actually want to just see hardware. Um, and it connects to, of course, they want to drive the traffic to their cloud. So that's where you see, you know, the device SDK stops here, and then, then if you go on their website, you'll see the hardware uh, evaluation board you can buy. Um, alliances, I won't spend a whole lot of time, but there's a lot of alliances for IoT. Everyone's trying to do the land grab and set a standard. Um, there's Qualcomm, they started all join, and then they, they handed the source code to the Linux Foundation, and then there's some merging with Intel, and I can't keep up with this. This has gone over the past two to three years. Um, but everyone's in there, all the big guys, right? Cisco's in there, Intel, Microsoft, Qualcomm, Samsung. Um, here's just another diagram of all joint. It's nothing that unique. It's just on how they perceive the implementation of the use cases of the app, at the application layer, at least, uh, you know, maybe below the layer seven on interoperability, um, management, that type of thing. So again, um, all join is more for um, the home. It's not necessarily for industrial, although you'll find a lot of industrial apps will use uh, Zigbee and they'll use the home automation side uh, spec uh, of Zigbee for an industrial app. Um, so the, there's the industrial internet uh, consortium and their focus is security. They've released uh, these documents here. These are very good reads, by the way. So this is where you can kind of Google to that and download and take a look at their PDFs. Um, connectivity framework um, and the security framework, this one here, the volume G4 for industrial IoT has a really good, um, some really good uh, reads as well. Just put, uh, you know, some formal, those ones are kind of theoretical, but they're definitely, they're going to talk about the whole spectrum of the science, the corner cases, the terminology will be spot on. It will be like, you know, you're getting taught and it's just, you're being taught within 30 pages of great, great documents there. Um, there's another one, the Internet of Things Consortium. They're more of a nonprofit trade. And then these are just a couple um, consortiums, uh, industry standards out there. There are tons that keep coming on the scene like every month, literally. Um, and it's just gonna take some time before they whittle out. Um, these guys wanna jump start business development, um, raise education to consumers. 
Again, Bryce and Whirlpool, Honeywell, Belkin, they're all involved. They don't want to miss out. Um, as, as you can see here, there's so much going on in IoT that um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, I think, for a lot of you. I think a lot, a good handful of you guys are fighting some good money um, in the IoT space in the next few decades. Um, so let's go to the government, the federal level, right? I'm just going to bring up the federal level. Um, so the FTC, they have a division of privacy and identity protection. Um, they research and advise on secure APIs, authentication, and product updates. Um, what well, companies release security updates long after the initial product release? To date, they barely do. It's got to be low cost. There's no incentive um, because they're not charging you as a service to kind of bankroll the improvements of software. Um, and they're kind of disposable and nobody seems to care. And then if there was a firmware update, it's complicated. You've got to have physical access. You've got to push the button this way and connect it, you know, R232 or something, it's like, come on, right? Um, it's over the air, it doesn't mean people do that either, but uh, it's a challenge. So they say, hey, if routers and smartphones have issues today, physical routers, um, you know, the good smartphones we have, is there hope for IoT through the fragmentation of sheer numbers and devices and networks? Like, you know, how end users are allowed to become aware and then apply those uh, those patches or updates. Um, so the main concerns are transparency, deceptive practices, because they do want to kind of protect uh, your PII. Um, and they actually can enforce consumer privacy and safety. Um, so a UL um, actually is a listing for electrical devices to say, hey, it's not going to shock you, it won't burn up, what have you. Well, there's actually IoT certification uh, movement going under UL to say, okay, that IoT gadget has a UL IoT certification in a similar way, but not for an electrical, it's going to shock you or, or catch fire, but it's not going to like cause you uh, problems in, in society, in your life, or you know, it's not going to break something real bad and hurt you be detrimental to you as a user. So it's kind of interesting that UL has gone from electrical fires and shorts to, you know, is it usable, is it datable, is it safe, um, you know, with your private information, what have you. Um, is it going to, so hey, uh, Bluetooth locks, door locks, right? Uh, someone did a research on, took a handful of Bluetooth uh, door locks, and all, several of them did not implement that layer one uh, the security print. They could hack every single one of them and get into your house. Uh, at, the, at the, the group that they looked at. I'm like, wow. I mean, yeah, it's kind of secure at higher layers, but if they don't apply security at all seven layers, or at least, you know, the physical layer, which a lot of them leave out, uh, they can break into your house. Um, so, FCC focus uh, on, is on IoT security by design. Here, here you're going to hear the theme with the federal guys. So, they wrote a white paper, it came out in January. Security by design is a practice of continual testing, authentication, safeguards, and adherence to best practices. Really good paper. Um, <clears throat> they want self-cyber uh, self accountability because they don't have power like the FTC to enforce. Um, and yet, the only thing they can do is propose uh, notice of propose further rulemaking to kind of gently force people to uh, self-regulate. Uh, um, they, they really could go further. They had the idea on the open internet rules to bar ISPs from blocking any traffic emanating from IoT devices, or at least those with easily circumventing security protocols. So, just with it, yesterday, two senators have proposed a bill on IoT security to say, hey, these IoT gadgets have got to have secure basics in place, or it'll be illegal. The bill was just proposed yesterday by two senators on both sides. Um, again, FCC didn't have the power to regulate. Um, so this is the GOA. They came out in May, an IoT technology assessment. Um, status and implications of an increasingly connected world. So here are the, the summary. Inherent risks and potential challenges. Um, we all heard about those webcams being hacked last year, the Mirai. Um, those were kind of advanced um, ARM devices with a little OS, maybe even like a micro Linux or some sort, right? 
not really that end node, um, because it had its own SD card and you know, PC to PC. It was pretty advanced for those webcams. But again, um, you know, those took a lot of networks down. And I understand people like StubHub, they couldn't sell tickets for like hours, and they lost money by the hour. I mean, and they had nothing they could prevent from being hurt by that, by these cans, right? So. Um, privacy, you get stored, transferred, and sold without your knowledge or consent. Um, safety, the cars were hacked, um, you know, with the Jeeps, and I understand Black Hat had another, um, at the uh, IoT Village, they had another, one of my colleagues presented on another car, I forget the name, one of them, I think it was Subaru. He showed the hacking it, you know, the key file, the wireless connection. So, it's still ongoing with that, the safety. Um, standards. Technical intercommunications, of course, are, are fairly lacking. And then the economic issues, right? I mean, shoot, stock market can, you know, lose a lot first, depending on the on the uh, fallout from this. So, Department of Home, Homeland Security, oh my gosh, what do they have to do with IoT? They've published strategic principles for securing the Internet of Things, version one, last November. This is also a good download to read. Here's the, the skinny. They suggest the following principles. Listen to the theme. Incorporate security at the design phase. Promote security updates and vulnerability management. Build on recognized security practices, which a lot of you guys have on the building and, and laptop, cell phone networks, right? Now apply that to all the other things that are coming out. Um, promote transparency across IoT. Connect carefully and deliberately. Oh, right? Probably been so open. Uh, until we figure things out, which may take a decade. NIST, um, great publications here. You can you can read the titles here. They have framework for um, advanced manufacturing, building, transportation. It came out in June. Um, another smart cities, uh, smart cities uh, architecture document they came out with because they want to have some sort of stability to smart cities um, and industrial infrastructure. So they published. Another one back in April. Um, report on lightweight cryptography. So this is what they recommend for these little microcontrollers, the 8 bits, the 32 bits. They don't have a whole lot of power, but they need to be as secure as everything else. So they wrote a, a big uh, paper on how to secure, uh, you know, what to implement protocol-wise on those microcontrollers. Um, and then they actually published um, another article. Sorry, more like a. Well, a reference document on the network of things, the Internet of Things. Um, this is a, you know, another good. Uh, this is another good uh, basic theory document that I've read like all of these documents. So, um, so then when I was growing up, there was I was into robots a little bit, and I see someone smiling back there. Isaac Asimov. I haven't heard that name in, in in a while since then because then robots kind of petered out, and I built a robot on a remote control car that I thought that was cool. I don't know how old I was. But there are three laws that he came out with. A robot may not injure a human being through inaction or allow human beings to come to harm. Um, it must follow orders, except if it conflicts with the first law. And it must protect its own existence as long as protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So I think some of this came out with the Terminator movies. We'll now look at security architects, three laws of IoT. Similar. I don't know who wrote up these necessarily, but uh, why not? Obviously, an Isaac Asimov man. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe he watched the Bicentennial Man. So, Cisco and IoT. All right, getting back to Cisco and IoT. We know there's been some announcements at Cisco Live. Today, there's not much out there now. What does that tell you? It's just on the beginning of the, of the cusp. Of a growth at Cisco because Cisco is focusing on IoT. They just don't have stuff up today. But they've announced Jasper Control Center 7, uh, real time control and visibility to launch, manage, and monetize IoT deployments. All right, I think that was announced as well as Kinetic. So, two platforms you've got the traditional Jasper <coughs> embed cellular modems. Now they're going to enable stuff downstream for the IoT, those end nodes. Right, that we've been talking about. 
then you have a whole new platform called Kinetic announced for connection management, fog computing, and data delivery. So this is like now not just the bottom three layers or only four, but like all seven layers is my understanding from this without me going to Cisco Live. And What's fog computing? So it's like a cloud, but it's, it's hanging much lower to the ground. I think there's a guy at Cisco that coined that one. <laughs> it's probably kind of like edge computing, um, I would say. So then there's Cisco IoT and Threat Defense. It's been announced. Um, it likes my cookies and sends those ads to when I'm surfing on stuff. And I'm like, oh, IoT Threat Defense. So I click on uh, research again from the outside. Um, they don't have anything real that I can tell of. I mean, they stop at the self. They have an Android product. It doesn't do a whole lot. I don't think they have an Apple. They do have an Apple enhancement applet that enhances QoS and things like that with an Apple initiative. So there's nothing beyond that. Um, but I think, uh, well, it's announced. So I think they're definitely going to come up with stuff. They'll probably have to buy a couple of people. And this is true. Uh, this came out about a month ago. Cisco had a breast cancer detection device sensor system in a bra. IoT's powerful life-saving potential called IT bra. I guess it's what it did is sent higher temperature, um, and then it can notify the doctor to say, hey, you don't, you know, come in the doctor now. There's an outbreak detected. So um, Cisco's doing stuff on IoT. I mean, look at that application. That's different, right? I mean, I would have expected that. Um, last phase here, security companies and uh, IoT. Uh, I've changed my time zone to try and get that WebEx going. But. So quantum resistant cryptography for everything like the IoT. So quantum resistant cryptography. That's definitely hot right now because AES can be can be cracked by cryptography in theory, um, and probably will sooner than we expect. Um, as you know, DES, triple DES, and AES keeps getting deprecated as computing power accelerates each decade. So now it's definitely quantum uh, resistant cryptography that they're getting into. Um, the company called Brainspace, they, their theme is Accelerate Human Potential. They have a product called Discovery 5, the fast, fastest and most powerful weapon for conducting digital investigation, harnesses ML and AI to search unstructured data for legal e-discovery. Remember I told you about that digital trail that you're not really leaving, but you kind of are, it's just not being captured? And when it does get captured, fly an L. Oh no, trust the government to do the right thing. Uh, or hope there's good enough checks and balances out there. Zigbee War Drone Driving. You've heard of Wi Fi Drive back around 2000. Um, Zigbee War Drone Driving. A couple of thoughts here that's been happening. There's an effort going on in Austin doing that to map out. What homes have Zigbee devices? Um, and then there's guys in Europe that are taking their hacks of uh, 802.50.4 Zigbee, and they're showing how um, they can make lights on these public buildings. I'm not sure how legal that is, but they're making them go haywire. Um, and then they've done research to say, okay, we know how to uh, hack a certain uh, chipset of Zigbee and um, infiltrate with malicious code, and actually we can shut off the light. We can have it do anything we want it to do, and it self-propagates because it's RF mesh. They just inject it with the drone. They need at least 15,000 Zigbee nodes as a critical mass, um, and they theoretically done this and modeled it uh, for the city of Paris. And, and the hack does work today. So Zigbee war drone driving that might be a new hobby for some of you. Vicarious is a company bring human-like intelligence to the world of robots. Okay, so catch. I, I looked this up and I'm like, okay, it means completely automated public Turing test to tell computers to <coughs> apart. I didn't know that. Just I, I put that in there. But they uh, so their theme is to bring human-like intelligence to the world of robots. And I hear that Target's coming out with a robot soon to answer questions in the store. But they built a system that never saw capture before. Never saw it. Just clean letters. They were trained for just the clean letters of the alphabet, not these weird fonts and twisted on purpose. 
the system was able, it taught itself, to read correctly a broad array of fonts of the challenges. That's amazing. Teach itself when it, all it had was clean letters and it could actually answer correctly all these twisted fonts. Us humans have a hard time, I have a hard time trying to get it right. I think for CAPTCHA you've got to get most of those letters right and then it should pass. But I hate the pick the squares with the sign on the car and I'm like, I hit it wrong. Seriously, I, I need an L. But <laughs> NVIDIA invested deep instinct. That's a, a deep learning cybersecurity startup. This is the future of threat detection. Um, I'm seeing a lot of this go on, but NVIDIA has stuff going on for auto, autonomous cars. But in terms of uh, threat detection, it's, uh, it's going to be in machine learning and deep learning, definitely. Um, two more slides. So Microsoft launches IoT as a service for enterprises. You think you need actual IoT hardware like the Raspberry Pi to get started, like some of you guys may want to get into, but maybe not so sure about this hardware stuff. They got a Raspberry Pi emulator online with a breadboard simulator today that works. Wow. I mean, that's how bad Microsoft wants you to get from breadboarding to their cloud. They'll emulate it for you. Um, Open Linux Foundation has launched the uh, Edge X Foundry, and so this is an open standard for the uh, industrial IoT gateways that are typically those edge uh, gateways that do all the packet processing, <coughs> protocol processing, uh, advanced analytics, what have you, before it, it sends it to the cloud and only if needed because sometimes real time to the cloud isn't fast enough or you're out in the boonies and you don't have that connection or there's just no need, or you can just post, uh, post process it, pre-process it before you send, filter, you know, a lot of smaller data set to the cloud. So there's an EdgeX Foundry uh, spec on that. These are just some of the specs. A good website, I mean a really good reference website is postscapes.com. Very comprehensive reference IoT website. The whole marketplace. Check it out, post, I, have, I don't know anyone there. And then um, the Cloud Security Alliance, there's an IoT working group. It's really secure IoT working group, but um, they have stuff going on there. Um, I actually have contributed to that and as a key contributor in one of the documents. But you can get involved on a lot of these uh, consortiums and things. In some cases, like the CSA, um, you don't have to pay money. You don't have to pay $2,000 and have a big name behind it as a corporate sponsor or anything like that, like Bluetooth does, you know. Um, and then this is another really cool link, 67 open source tools and resources for IoT. Uh, another great link. Here's my last slide. So, like you mentioned, uh, the FAIR, the Facebook, uh, they had artificial intelligence chat box that developed their own language and were talking to each other in this new language without human input. Um, pretty impressive. Um, yeah, this is a document that we published uh, last year, 13 Steps to Developing Secure IoT Products. So, very good document. It's not too, um, technical. it's not extremely technical, but it's not too terse either. It's a really medium and uh, in-depth on whole, like, software development cycle, and broken down to, like, authentication, physical access, what have you. Um, so I won't even get to blockchain. Um, blockchain can be applied to IoT uh, for transactional reasons um, because these nodes uh, you know, have, are remote and they don't have access to the internet directly. So you have a, a copied uh, blockchain out for that region or that network and it's gonna communicate with each other, what have you. So FinTech, financial technology, blockchain, People are trading money on, on, on crypto cryptography today, making some money and losing some, but um, that's the, the roller coaster ride there, right? I mean, more risk, uh, more to make. Um, so there's an alliance. I think this uh, fairly new one, Trusted Internet of Things Alliance, IOTA. Um, Android Things, um, it's in preview mode. So you know the Android um, OS on your phone? Um, they have Android Things, it used to be called Brillo. They're going to have the apps, sorry, the Play Store on uh, Android Things, and it's uh, a derivation of uh, SE Linux, Android OS. 
Um, and so APK is the, uh, the application for your Android, and you can actually create those with the same um, Android Studio today um, for your Raspberry Pi, for example. Um, and so this is pretty interesting, I think pretty darn neat. Um, and then the healthcare industry, there's a task force here. Um, man, there's so many hacks you can hack in the healthcare industry. They, they can see the research and they're shaking in their own boots that, I mean, you can really probably kill someone down the road here. I mean, there's a ton of Bluetooth in the, in the hospitals today. Um, Cisco has uh, Bluetooth routers that go into hospitals to do all the uh, uh, sending of either, you know, updates. I don't think they do um, in building location yet with uh, BLE beacons. Another hot topic is uh, in building location with BLE beacons because when uh, I'm not being tracked on the uh, on the inside of the building because GPS goes away, nobody still wants to track me um, on the inside of the building with BLE beacons, what have you, with trilateralization. Although I'm going to get all those benefits and buy into it because I'm just going to benefit me. But hey, now they can probably, once they perfect that technology, Google and Apple are putting a ton of money into that in building uh, location side of things. Again, I think BLE is a uh, one good way to do it. Um, as well as the accelerometer and things to kind of know how many steps you took as soon as you entered the building. But other than that, I'm done um, at this point. So any other questions? Um, anything at all? Hopefully uh, some of this was interesting to you guys. Uh, yes? So I know Cisco has the, like the CTNA industrial. Do so you think there's a uh, roadmap for IoT certification, or is that, you know, if there's any plans for that? Or I don't know, needed, but or? I would foresee that the fact that they've come up with all these other uh, concentrations in the DNA, they probably will, right? Yeah, so the security DNA and what have you. Uh, I think they probably would have it, right? But, see, that's the thing, the certifications for, um, like, CCNA and the CISP and CCSP and what have you. I'm not seeing any certifications on that front yet. There's probably, I think, a little bit of talk, but like, it's bound to happen, right? Well, they got the CCNA industrial, but it's really new, and I know nothing about it. Yeah, so, industrial control systems, yeah, well, ICS. It's, it's geared towards more like the SCADA sometimes. So, yeah, really it's SCADA, ICS, that's ICS. So, yeah. Yes. And once IoT is like fully matured, how do you think it would like impact I guess like first and second level like network support guys? Not people like designing and implementing this, but supporting yeah. it. How do you think it will impact our, our daily uh, job? You'll probably have to learn like Jasper and um yeah, what's their other platform? Spark. Well there's more Spark that I'm not so aware of. But yeah, I think you're gonna have to learn that because it just become a mainstream. Um, as the stuff gets deployed and used in the world. Think, think about this. I mean, the automotive industry pretty much got wiped out in terms of the individual guys bolting stuff together with the result of robots. With all the AI learning and telemetry and data collection and some of the stuff I've been seeing, a lot of the guys that are sitting there in the knock watching the networks and taking care of it, be an AI application eventually. Well, with, there's already so much automation programming in there already. Yeah, but I think with the UPOE where you get 60 watts per port, that's going to change a lot of stuff because you no longer have to run electrical the same way. They're doing light Cisco cells. Okay. Yeah, the, lights one there. of my old buddies at Cisco, they, they get Marriott, they were putting in all sorts of stuff in all the hotels. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just like, wow, what an idea. Let's just take the PoE off of an Ethernet switch and run it out with Cat5. And here, here's the reason that that was so uh, advantageous to the uh, hotel guy. You don't need electricians. You can fire the unions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no well, electricians yeah. needed to pull Cat5. <laughs> All I, say, I can see getting a network alert every time my light bulb goes on. Yeah. <laughs> so that's job security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I fix light bulbs. Well, on the other side, yeah, there's some talk I didn't mention. Um, people are starting to talk about 
<laughs> like I think the Fed, right? Jobs are going to get obsolete faster than they're thinking because of this automation, because of the Amazon effect. Uh, I understand uh, they have a robot that throws your product in a box, and it's a robot that does it. And one of those dudes was saying uh, he thinks that there will be robots building robots. Why not? There already are. Okay. There already are. So I, I just think that where we've come, where we're going, the opportunities are exciting. Uh, the challenges are exciting too. Um, I think this is just like. But it's all changing. It's just changing. If you so can keep bad. up with it, or at least That's why you come it. here. That's why you come here. Um, and maybe we get that Cisco VP of uh, yeah. IoT uh, luminary. We can maybe try and fight him down here. Down there. Sure. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for your time.